Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to places I'd like you to go to. The first one's familiar to you, I'm sure, and that's Psalm 77, verse 3. If you've been around me for any amount of time, I talk about this verse. I, I give it to a women a lot. I tell them uh, this is their problem, and they love me for it. Uh, Psalm 77, verse 3, it says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, yep. look at it, I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Amen. Yep. Amen. Amen. Uh, notice uh, there that it says the spirit gets overwhelmed. Right. Man's spirit gets overwhelmed. And I preach about that a lot, how that what it does to the psyche and all that. But I want to get to the other end of this thing tonight. Amen. I want to go over to uh, Numbers chapter 14. And I'd like to look at where this thing of complaining pops up. Pops up early in the life of man. Amen. And uh, in Numbers chapter number 14, and, and uh, quickly you find out that as God has led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he's done it by what they call a high hand, a heavy hand. That is, it was something for everybody to see. The Old Testament says they left with a high hand. We would call it a high five. They left with high hands. They left and they left with a great noise. Do you remember one of the things God had them do? Go around and borrow from everybody. Borrow from everybody and they'll give it to you. Tell them you're leaving, you're never probably coming back again and you wanna borrow their fine china, right? And God says, I'll have them give it to you, amen? And you'll find favor in their sight. You know why they found favor in their sight? Because the Jews among the Egyptians were nothing but a blessing. Did you hear me? Joseph went into Egypt at a time where if he didn't show up and have a dreamer's uh, 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 eye and know what was being said, he wouldn't have been able to give the forecast for the great dearth that would take place. He literally, Joseph, saves Egypt. Not only saves them, makes them wealthy. He says, here's what you do. You take it during the good time store and buy everything from everybody. Get all the wheat you can get from everybody, and you hold on to it. And then during the great dearth, you'll sell it to everybody. You'll make a fortune. Forget about it. And that's what happens. Yeah. See? So they were blessed people. But somewhere along the line, God had wanted them to leave that place and become their own people, have their own identity. So God doesn't have them leave this place of comfort this place of, of, of where they did have a job. And right. we think of them as slaves being whipped and beaten. But if you look historically, that's not how that played out. They were there working, but they were skilled workers. They were able to do good things. It wasn't until the end when God wanted them to leave Egypt that God began to make it miserable for them. Right. A man named Moses showed up and began to make things miserable. Moses went, and as a great union representative, Tony, he walked into the office of Pharaoh Inc., and he said, I demand. And they said, guess what? You demand good. We're going to take something away from you. It's, not a, it's, it's the way you do business, folks. You want to learn how to do business? Read your Bible. Yeah. Read your Bible, and you'll learn how to become a millionaire. Right. It's all in there, right? So he has them leave High-handed is what the Bible calls it. High-handed, look it up. They leave high-handed. They leave and they get all this wealth. Then as they're traveling, God knowing how man is, he begins to do things like, I will guide you. I will bring a pillar of fire down from heaven in view of all of you, not just Moses and Aaron, not just the 70 elders, but everybody. They all watched it. And the Bible says that when the pillar moved, they moved Tom. When the pillar stayed still, if it stayed still for 30 days, they stayed still for 30 days. Literally being guided, led step by step. Huh? Yeah. Not only that, God takes and he has just to show how strong he is. He has the greatest army in all the world for the last 400 years. The children of Israel, who are in bondage for 400 years, by the way. Real bondage in Egypt, for, for anyway. Uh, 400 years as slaves, if you will. In Egypt, um, I lost my whole train of thought. And uh, so God has them take those children of Israel from there. And Moses walks in. He demands they take that away from him. They get into that land. God brings that pillar of fire down. They've been following that thing. Now God takes the greatest army in all the world and has them hot on their heels, is what the Bible says. Hot on their heels. They were ready to get them. 
Right. And what God does is he leads Moses, not to an escape route, but to a place, a rock and a hard place. Right. You know where the rock and the hard place come from? If you read your Bible, you know that Balaam was stuck between a rock and a hard place. He was riding on that jackass that day, and that jackass saw the angel of the Lord, and the jackass backed him into a, a wall, and then got him where he was stuck, between a rock and a hard place. You'll find it all in the Bible, everything you need to know. So what happens is God brings the greatest army that there is, and he brings him down against these children of Israel. By the way, the Bible says, Moses led the armies of God. First time it's mentioned, his armies. Armies of God out of Egypt. Huh? They were leaving, and the captain of the host, uh, we get, what, the captain of the host is leading them out. He's been, he's been their God. Huh? Yeah. He's been their God. Aaron's been the spokesman. Moses has it. Moses isn't the one doing it. Aaron's the one. He's doing it. Now, God uses Moses, and he stands at that water. Yeah. Huh? The Red Sea. And he's standing there looking at that thing, and no matter how you want to look at it, some have said, guess what, Brother Joe? It's okay. It's no big deal. There was only two inches of water during that time. The great east wind and, and the reeds were passed back in that thing, and they just passed right through it. No big deal. Great. Because even a greater miracle happened then, even though it didn't. But great. Even a greater miracle happened than that. That means God killed the greatest army in all their world, in the world, with a bunch of dirt. They drowned on it. How'd that happen? Right. Uh, one way or the other, a great miracle took place there. We know that it was this miracle. God took and had the waters recede back and become like great walls. Great walls of water. And the children of Israel, each and every single one of them, had to walk through that thing. Oh, yeah. Is it going to come down now? Right. Going to come down half in between? Right. I'm going to wait till everybody gets to the other side before I go make sure this thing works. Amen? Huh? All kinds of things are playing out, but what God is doing is revealing himself. Mm -hmm. Why? So there'll be no complaints later. Yeah. Right. Right. There'll be nobody later on able to go, I don't think God can. Mm -hmm. I don't right. think God's able to right. do this one. This one must be too big for him. You know what he tells him at one point? He said, I did all these miracles for you down there. I brought all the, I took and brought flies and lice and frogs and blood. I did all, and darkness and hail, a fire came. All these things I did all the way till Egypt becomes the loudest. Could you imagine this sound on that hour, the midnight hour? When the death angel went through Egypt, and as in each house he went by, all of a sudden you'd hear, Pete? Oh my God, Pete! And then the next house, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God! The Bible said that Egypt was a great roaring of mourning. Yeah. Why? So that everybody would understand who this God was that just took the children of Israel out of Egypt. Yeah. He wasn't somebody to be trifled with. Right. Now there's something about complaining that he don't care for. Yeah. Now it's bad that you women and us guys get overwhelmed and our spirit gets overwhelmed. Ready? Oh boy, Joe, he's going in the back and he's running the muck and he's going to go over to the side and he's going to knock the thing over and he's going to climb up on a ladder and blah, 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 blah. You get over. That's bad enough. Yeah. But it's worse. God is listening. To everything we say, yeah. he takes it personal, yeah. like he did when I was just saying. He might have been you, though, I don't know. <laughs> but I was the one standing in front of him. And he took it personal all of a sudden. All of a sudden, he thought all that yelling and all that hollering must be about him. Right. And he took it personal. Well, God takes it personal when we begin to complain. Yeah. So he says, when you begin to complain about Tony, God don't look at it as you're complaining about Tony. You're complaining to him about Tony. And you're complaining that God didn't make them right. right. And it's right. the same thing with us men. We go to God, oh, you didn't do this right. No, what we're doing is saying you made a mistake. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. uh -huh. Nothing different than what the LGBTQT and the rest of that crowd is doing, yeah, saying yeah. God's made a mistake. God made a mistake when he used America to free slavery, to abolish it in a whole country, to set the precedence for the world to understand something. 1865, what have we say? No more. Never again will a man be in chains, huh? What happened? What happened to that great event? That thing that as a child I grew up feeling proud that we were the group, we Americans. 
I'm really American late. My parent, grandparent, 1903's here, but we're not from that era. Most of us aren't. You neither. We're not from that era. But guess what? I feel pride in that. Yeah. That the country that my grandparents came to and brought us and left our name here ended up being a place that we look back and say they did away with slavery. Are we perfect? No, but we did away with that yeah. thing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So anyway, complaining, murmuring, taking and saying to God, you made a mistake. You know what? The funny thing is, is the more you look at it, you understand that it really isn't the average black man that's complaining about his plight. The average black man has a great love for God. They're in church. I just, we were talking about Kentucky, preaching in Kentucky. We're in Kentucky preaching a camp meeting, and we preach with three black men in Kentucky. All right? I'm just telling you that this idea of blacks and whites not getting along, when? Where? Not during my time. I was born in the 60s when that thing broke wide open. And all of a sudden, our sisters did date black men. And all of a sudden, even Italian-American families all of a sudden had to grasp a hold of this thing that our daughters and sons were making decisions for themselves. And either we would be okay with it or we would continue with our remarks, continue to push them away, and have no relationship with them. We chose not to go that way. We chose to say your family. It doesn't matter what color the skin you are. If you come into my family and you're a Rizzuti, however you got here, don't matter to me. You're mine now, and I love you. And that's the way it is. Well, we start complaining to God about our heritage. We start complaining to God about our lot in life. We start complaining about all kinds of things. And the children of Israel, in Numbers chapter number 14, after all of these events, God brings the children of Israel to the bottom of the land of promise. Notice what I called it, the land of promise. Not the land of battle, the land of promise. He brings them down there, they're at the bottom of that thing, and God says, you take your 12 and send them up. And he gets them 12 and sends them up. And they go up there, and they spy that land out. And they go up and they look and they get around and they get in there. And all of a sudden they see men of great stature. And they see that they've been able to genetically alter fruits and animals and different things. And God has already said, I am going to destroy the Jebusites, the Amalekites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, all of the rest of them. I'm going to destroy that seed. And I'm going to use this little people called Israel to do it. I'm going to take like I did with David. David with the rock and a few stones. He's going to take that giant out while the men of war stand there. God had a plan. Yes. Guess what happens? Ten go up. And they see something different than the other two, Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua go up there. They believe the promise that God has given. That is, the land is ours. The other ten went up and they went and they looked at the land and they said the inhabitants are too big. Yeah. They said the task at hand is too great. Not for us, too great for Jehovah God. Right. Are you with me? Yeah. It was, listen, they understood that they wouldn't be able to do it. What they were saying was God can't do it. Right. God took it personal. Yeah. You go, how do you know? Because watch what happened. Now I just gave you a bunch of history in just a few moments, but we got here to this. Verse 33 of 13 is what they say, or 32. They, they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel. By the way, it was 40 days. 40 days they searched that land. For 40 days they searched the land according to verse number 34. It says, after the number of days in which she searched the land, even 40 days. You see it? 40 days they searched the land out. Now watch it. They come back and they say this, the land through which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. He's talking about cannibalism. Right. He's talking about a group of people that will take our babies and eat them alive. Our women won't be safe. The inhabitants of this land will eat us up. God can't do it. Now watch how it plays out. He says, he says, the land eateth the inhabitants of watch it. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Just in case you thought you didn't know what he was talking about. He says, and there we saw the giants. 
He didn't say a giant. He said the giant. Huh? Watch this. He says, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. In case you miss it, ready? And so were we in their sight. In case you think I'm just using a little uh, hyperbole, a little colorful language, huh? I'm not. Hey, not only was I looking at and they look, man, we're little compared to them. Now, chapter 14, verse number one. I think a long time in this preacher to get where he's going, amen? So he says, this guy gives you a verse and never gets there. Watch this, chapter 14, verse one. And all, here's the problem, Carissa. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And God sat above the circle of the earth. And he said, the last time I heard crying like this is when I freed you from Egypt. When I killed the firstborn of every living man and beast. And now you're crying because the job is too right. big for me. Mm -hmm. You see, your view of God is your problem. God can't do it. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he can take, and if we need 500,000 instead of 300,000, he'll bring the 500,000 in. It's what he does. Watch this. It says this. It says, all the congregation lifted up their voice faster, and they cried. The people wept that night. Watch it. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Anything but to be led to a land that has this luscious fruit, that has all this beauty. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's everything that we needed from the garden of Eden. Up. Here it is. Can't have it, though. Our God's not big enough. Mm. Our God is not able to deliver us. <laughs> huh? We sing the song, our God is able to do Do we really mean it? So you got to believe what happens. Yeah. Because God takes it personal, Sister Rachel. And he says this, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land? Here they are crying at night. To fall by the sword, watch it, that our wives and our true children should be prayed. Preacher, where'd you get there with cannibals? All your wives and your children should be praying. Who's gonna be who are they who's gonna be hunting them? The giants. Yeah. We're talking about a half a million chickens <laughs> who come. And these giants are gonna eat and devour us. There's no hope for us here. You've led us to the slaughter. Would to God you left us in Egypt to die, Moses. Moses, would to God you would have let us die in the wilderness than to bring us all the way here, only to lay here all night long and understand there's no hope. There's no hope. You know what happens in the last days? The church becomes hopeless. Yes. The church becomes where they don't believe God can deliver them right. anymore. They begin to believe they need to give in yeah. just to be able to adapt to the new normal. Yeah. Let me tell you something about a new normal. It ain't nothing new, folks. Right. It's nothing new. I'm not going to go there because I'm going to stop. Watch this thing. <laughs> Verse 4. They said one to another, watch it, let us make a captain. Let us return. You know what that's called? Mutiny. Yeah. Yeah. Mutiny. Mm -hmm. Mutiny. Ready, Tony? Moses and Aaron. Here's why. You want to know my, why Moses is the meekest man in all the world? Right here. They just voted on getting a new leader and everybody leaving and going back to Egypt. What does Moses do? Watch it. Moses and Aaron fell on their face before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Huh? Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were, were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes. So Moses, get a picture of this. All of Israel have decided, Moses and Aaron, we've got our own man. We're heading back. Moses looks at him. He doesn't get full of pride and say, I'm the man of God in this place. He drops on his face and man. begins to weep and pray. And, uh, and Joshua and Caleb, they look and they see the men of God drop on their face and they rip their clothes and begin to mourn. They understand what's taking place. Yeah. 
This is God's people at their worst. God's people being rebellious. God's people knowing the power of God's hand and them saying it doesn't matter. We want to go back where we can see the leeks and we can see the cucumbers and we can see and taste the garlic and we can have a little safety. We don't want to be out here trusting in God. Soon they'll cry out, make us a king over us so that we can be like all the other nations. Soon they'll tell Samuel, God's leadership's not good enough. But it starts right here. Watch this. And it goes on and it says this. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, huh, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Yeah. Since they thought they had to fight to get it. They just need to believe the promise of God. And God would deliver them. That's what God does. Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness sake. Have you believed God? Do you truly believe he can do the impossible thing? Or do you say it to him half-heartedly, not believing he truly can deliver on his promise? Know what God calls this event? A breach of promise. A breach of promise. I won't get there. You got to study for yourself. Breach of promise is what it's called. That is, they didn't believe that God would keep his promise. They believed that God was like a man that would promise them something and they're not delivering. We break his promise. He goes on and it says this. It says, Watch it. He says, he'll give us that land. Huh? We didn't fight for it. The land which floweth with milk and honey. That's that land, Tony. What land? The land that Abraham talked about. Yeah. Y'all remember Abraham, don't you? I know it's been 400 years, but you remember Abraham, don't you? Abraham stood there with God. And God said, look up at the stars, boy. And if you can tell the stars, then you'll know how many took. How? I'm 90, what are you, are you kidding me? What did God do? God gave him a name that you and I to look at. Father Abraham. Yeah. Huh? A Gentile. Huh? A Gentile. Who are you? A Gentile. Yeah. Where are we in these last 2,000 years? God, once again, dealing with the Gentile. And, I, and they will. They will believe is what the Bible yeah. says. Stop thinking people won't believe. Yeah. Stop thinking lives can't be changed. Right, Stop right. thinking God isn't in the business yeah. of still taking lives yeah. and offering them. Because yeah. he does. Watch this. It says this. He says, ready? Verse 9, Pastor. He says, only rebel not ye against the Lord. This is the two boys talking. Neither fear ye the people of the land. Ready? For they are bread for us. We're not bread to them. They're bread to us. You're seeing it all backwards, Tony. He looked at those. You think they're going to eat my wife and my kids? Hey, man, no, sir. They'll be bread to us. Why? Because I believe what God said to Abraham. He promised Abraham 400 years earlier, more than that, 400 years earlier, he promised Father Abraham that the land from here to here, all the way up to there, would be ours. I want that land. I want that promise. I want every promise that God gave to the Christian. I want it! He said he'd give me the Holy Ghost. He'd give me full power of the Holy Ghost. One of the powers of the Holy Ghost is to believe. To believe. Huh? He says, and he goes on, he says, fear, rebel, rebel not, fear not. Ready? Verse 10. But all the congregation, you say, boy, what a speech. Yeah. Huh? I don't, you know what? I don't get upset. Nobody gets all riled up when I get preached. It don't bother me a bit, because here these guys are just stood up and said some words like yeah. that. Watch what happens. He says, but all the congregation bade to stone them with stones. Wow. Kill all four of them. Kill the four of these ones. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. Mm. We've got to get rid of them. They believe in this God. Right. 
They believe that this God is actually going to give us the land. Yes. I went up there. I'm one of the ten. I saw the giants, man. There's no way. Our biggest and strongest men would not be able to fight them. It's impossible. They've got fruit the size of our heads. They could bite our heads off with one bite. Listen, they didn't come back with some story of the guys are bigger than us there. The team has a greater weight factor. Yeah. Right? We're underweight here. So, no, not at all. He goes on and he tells him this. He says, and the Lord says, this is amazing again with the Lord, how Moses does again. Watch it. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Something tells me, Tony, they were going to stone these boys yeah, to death. Yeah, yeah. God had to intervene yeah, supernaturally. Yeah, yeah. Watch what happens. He says, and the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? Right. How long will it be ere they believe me? told you it was about believing. Look what he goes on to say, sis. He says, for all the signs which I have shown among them. Can you feel the frustration of God? I never got to see those signs. I used to ask for a curtain to move as a young boy so that I would know there was a God in heaven looking at me and my sisters and my brother and uh, watching over us while we lived with a blind grandma. Huh? And that curtain never moved. Oh, God, if you're real, let us just this one time be able to go where everyone else is going. And, and you know, let us do this. We never got to go. Huh? We never got to go. Why? Because God knew one day he was going to put me somewhere and I'd hear a message. And I'd believe that message. And it would alter my life forever. And I'd go about for the rest of my life trying to alter people's lives with the same message I heard. That is, there is a miraculous God that does what he says. And what he says in this book will come to pass. Now watch this. He says, they want to stone him now. And he says, in the, watch it. He says, and the Lord said unto Moses that, right? And then verse number 12, he says, I'll smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. This is how early God wants to break the inheritance. <clears throat> he says, you don't got to worry about losing your inheritance. They did. Yeah. You were in my Bible class this morning. I talked about your rewards and your inheritance. I think if the children of Israel could be disinherited, you might make it yeah. up there, but you'll be disinherited. Yeah. There'll be no rewards. Mm -hmm. Huh? Why? They got burnt up. Right. That's what happens. Yeah. The things that you did for God end up being for nothing because there was something behind it. Amen? Right. Well, don't get disinherited. Then. Watch this thing. It goes on and it says... He says, uh, mm, he says uh, the pestilence and disinherit them. I'll make of thee, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, the believers, a nation mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. He's going to take up for them. He's going to now play on God's emotions and his, his name. Look what he says to him. He says, no, tell the and watch. And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. Verse 14. And they will tell it to who? The inhabitants of this land. God, if you do this, you got to understand the big picture. The big picture is God has a problem with the seed that lives in that land. Right. The seed is part of the serpent seed. Right. It's the seed that hates God. Yeah. It's in that land. Yeah. God likes to take the land where Satan is and put a garden in it. Well, he picked this land and he didn't take it where the midgets were. He took where the giants were. And he says, that's the land right there. He later on tells Saul, you kill every Amalekite. Men, women, children, kill them all. It's the same group of people that God's been trying to get rid of and he's still trying to get rid of them. The war's still taking place today. Yeah. You think it's by accident they want your DNA so bad? You think it's an accident that they're giving all they want tests and all this stuff? Right. We become these, we're like little lab rats. Yeah. They want to know what you're made of, folks. There was another man that they wanted to know what he was made of. His name was what? Noah. Yeah. And Noah was what? A perfect man in his generations. Yeah. He hadn't been altered at all. This battle is bigger than what you and I can see. Yeah. And God tells him right here. I mean, Moses tells him, he says, if you kill this people, they will then hear that you did it. Watch verse 14. For they have heard that the Lord art among this people, that the Lord art seen face to face. 
and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. If thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he swore. See, this could be presented in a court of law. It's what it's all about. This people up there hate God. And Moses is able to save all these Israelites by saying to God, if you kill them all as you would one man and wipe them out, the inhabitants of this land will hear tell of it. And it will go against you that you weren't able to do what you promised. Thus, the breach of promise that we'll never get to tonight. The breach of promise that God brings up and says to them, I hold you accountable for the breach of promise. That is those ten men. Do you know what the penalty was? The penalty for these ten men coming back after 40 days of searching the land is 40 years in the wilderness. Look with me, and otherwise we won't get there. It's all the way over a whole couple pages, amen? Go to verse number 34 to 35. Watch this. This is what he says to him in verse number 30, verse number 29, actually verse 28. He says, Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Ready? Here's what he says to those that complained, those that wanted to stone Moses, those ten men that went up there and said God couldn't. Ready? Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. All that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Thought they murmured against Moses. Right. Huh? Watch it. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save Caleb, the son of Jephna, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Ready? But, here's God rubbing it in their face. Watch it. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, huh? Them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. Why did they despise it? They didn't believe God could give it to them. The sin was not believing what God said. Watch it. He says, but as for you, he says, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. Here we go. 33. Your children shall wander. Sin for not listening. For 40 days of wandering and looking up there and coming back with a bad report on what God can and can't do, your children shall wander in the wilderness for 40 years. What will they do? Bear your whoredoms. How did it become whoredoms? They didn't believe God. They believed something else. Hey, pick your choice. It don't matter. One's as good as any other. If you believe it over God, you've made a choice. Ready? He says, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Here it comes. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquity. <coughs> 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Huh? You know what got me on this thing? That word's right there. You shall know my breach of promise. I said, God, what are you talking about? I know what a breach of promise is. I've been arrested for breach of peace more than once. Amen. <coughs> Any good preacher worker is solved ought to be arrested for breach of peace at least once in his life. Huh? But that grabbed a hold of me and that shook me to the core. And I said, what's it talking about? Verse 35. I, the Lord, have said, ready? I will show the congregation that are gathered together against me. Somebody took Personal. Yeah. In this wilderness they shall be consumed and they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned, and here it is, says, and made all the congregation to murmur against him. Notice now? Yeah. See how God's putting it back. He's switching up. Excellent. He's switching up his right. He says, uh, 
who returned and made all the congregation a murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. Verse 38. But Joshua, the son of Nun, Caleb, the son of Jephna, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. Now, why was that? That was because they had a different spirit. They had a believing spirit. Do you know what takes place? God brings Moses, gets 70 men, he brings the 70 men, and God puts the spirit that was on Moses on those 70 men. That spirit was now alive and moving. The other men knew it. Joshua and Caleb had that believing spirit. They believed what they saw. They didn't question it. You got to remember, they see the pillar of fire. Right. They walk through and yeah. see the water on either right. side. What's the big deal? Why is it only two out of the 12? Right. It's a spirit, folks. Mm -hmm. Do you know why you go through what you go through? Because God wants you to begin to believe. Remember with little Joe? I can take little Joe pretty much. Oh, I got to watch it. He trusts me so much that he'll jump when I'm not looking. Right, right. That's how God wants you to be. God wants you to be like, listen, I trust the Lord. He said it in his book. Amen. He Amen. said it in his book. Yeah. He said in his book, he'd never leave me nor forsake me. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. Either he's a liar or he's not. That's the question. Tonight. Are we a people that truly believe that God is going to do everything that he said? Or, or are we at home leaning on our own understanding? Are we at home trying to figure out, I'm doing the right thing, but everything's still falling apart? Yeah. Huh? These are the things that happen, the trying of your faith, yeah. uh, the testing. You know what it says about your faith? It's more precious. Yeah. More precious than anything else is that. The trying of your faith is precious. You need that to happen. Yeah. If you don't get tried, nobody will know you. God, you won't know what you'll do. Right. It's easy for a man to say, this is what I would do if that happened. But he doesn't know until it happens. You're driving in the car. Could be a great driver. And a deer runs in front of you. How about when they first came out with front wheel drive? And all us old timers had to learn not to go with the skid or whatever anymore. I forget yeah, now. Yeah. It's so long. But you guys are looking at it, huh? Huh? But right, you guys know. They drive old cars. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you, you learn, right? And all of a sudden, now these front-wheel drive cars, you didn't hit the brake at all. Right. What you did was you just kind of let the thing keep going, and you kind of just steer through it, they would say. You steer through it, right? So these were changes that I don't know why I got on there. Faith. Oh, right? So you, you got to take and begin to, once you get tried a few times, my brother Mike smashed about three of them back in the 80s, right? You know, smashing into things, right? He couldn't figure it out. He couldn't figure it out. It wasn't the same thing. Right. But what? After a couple of cars smashed up, yeah. you learn you don't hit the brakes and you don't go with the thing. Right. It's not the same thing. It's right. front wheels driving, <laughs> not the rear wheels driving. Rear wheels driving, you skid, you go with that thing. And you have a little fun with it. You go goosing around. But with the front wheel drive, till you learned how to get there, you would, same with driving a clutch. You know why women don't learn how to drive the clutch? The husband don't want to see the clutch burnt out. Because it's going to take her a while to learn it. If she won't, there's no clutch. Never. Oh, she never burnt out a clutch. She's an old truck driver from way back. Now, maybe these are crude examples, but what I'm trying to say to you is it takes time. Yeah. And it's the same thing with trusting God. Listen, back in the day, I didn't trust him like I do now. I'd have tried to figure everything out. I'd have had everything listed that we owed. I'd have listed a five-year plan, then my 10-year plan. I ain't lying to you. It's how I was trained. It's how you get trained, a five-year plan, how many seats you'll need, how big of a building you'll need, all these things, and you plan God right out of it. Because right. now what you're beginning to do is work your plan. Right. You're trying to make something happen, and it's going to happen. If you're a man's man and you know about that, you're going to make it happen one way or the other. You're going to make it happen because that's what you think. You, listen, you got to get so close to God that you're okay if nobody shows up. Right. Amen. you got to be okay with you leading the singing to just yourself. Yeah. You're going to be a church planner. You're going to have to go through all kinds yeah. of things. 
Hey, they're not just church planters. They got a little baby and a three-year-old. Yeah. Try that on for size. Uh -huh. You want to know what happens to most pastors' wives? They're found in the back of churches all over America tonight, sitting in the back all by themselves with their three or four kids, yeah. all by themselves, waiting for the church service to end. And the pastor stands out there, good night, Lord yeah. bless you, bye Sonny, yeah. bye Mary, bye the old, bless you, bless you. All right, let's go get in the car. Yeah. Yeah. And they get in the car and a little kid sits in the back, he's been in church all day, tired, he's grumpy. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? But he gotta be spiritual. He's going to be this around. Listen, we got to face some facts here. The real world doesn't give a rip. It's all about him looking yeah. down. Yeah. Rather than have him complain, and rather than have you complain, God would have you be like, well, this is how my boy acts right now, and I love him. Amen. And I love yeah. him, and I discipline him, and I talk to him, yeah. and I let him know this isn't acceptable, yeah. and I let him know I'm not upset, I'm, I, I'm not happy with how he's acting, yeah. but daggone it, I'm not going to take the kid and lock him in a room That's somewhere right. and fake and act like my kids walk on water. Let me tell you something. The reason preachers' kids aren't in church anymore is because too many preachers wanted them kids to walk on water. Right. And if they didn't walk on water, they weren't accepted. So you know what they began to do? They began to look around and realize how much hypocrisy was in the church. And it was easy for them at 18, 20 years old to go, I'll never go back to church, Dad. Why? Because Deacon so-and-so is the one who showed me the pornography for the first time. And it was the deacon's son that gave me the grass behind the place. And it was so-and-so's sister that I'll never go back there. And now here we are with a chance to fix it. A chance to be okay with a three-year-old that wants to fly and zoom around that has a grandfather that runs the place and lets him do whatever he wants. Amen. That must be a blessing. How to have me uh, let him do everything. But the truth of the matter is, this is your hour yeah. to just go, Lord, I'm yours. And if this is what you want, and you want my little boy to run in circles, and I've done my, and all, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Be like the young pastor not being okay with the first three builders we had. He was right. satisfied with all of them. Yeah. Every single one of them we made look nice. Yes. Right? Every one of them we put our own time, sweat, money yeah. into. All of them. But I'll tell you, he was satisfied with all of them. Every single one of them. And it, and it took the Lord opening doors and moving in a special way. What's that called? That's called trusting God. He called us out. He called us to do something in this city, in this area, and to get something done. And you don't stop halfway. You keep going. If the field changes, you take and you recognize, yeah. my job is to still to continue on. Yeah. Let them change all around me, That's but I'm right. going to continue on doing Amen. what God called me to do. Yeah. As they're saying, get rid of the hymns. That's the great push. Get rid of the hymns. Bring in the worldly <coughs> music, and you can get in another 15, 20 people just like that. It will just change our song format. Well, either it's right or it's wrong. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, let me close because I could go yeah. on and on long, long time. Notice what he says here. He says in verse number 43, just so you don't forget it. Wait a minute. They're told not to go battle, right? They do. Verse 43. The Amalekites, the Canaanites that are there before you, they show, oh no, this is where God's uh, giving them the warning here. He says, the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. Ye and ye shall fall by the sword because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. These are the people that God hates. This is a seed that is of a mixture, and God doesn't like it. God wants to destroy it, but he's willing to let them kill Israelites for the breach of promise. He's willing to let them die in the wilderness. By the tens of thousands, 20 years on up, because of this breach of promise. He's willing to have them all die in the wilderness, and he's not only that, he's willing to let those that did nothing wrong wander for 40 years in the wilderness. He's now willing to let the Amalekites and the Canaanites, where we get our word cannibal, yeah. the Canaanites to come down, and with the edge of the sword, kill Israelites. Why? Because God takes 
what he says serious and what you do with it. If you don't believe these promises, he's listening and he knows it. He said all things work together for good. That includes someone dying, someone going in a joint, that includes someone getting sick, that includes all of it. When did all of a sudden we say COVID's the one thing that's not all things come for the good of all? Of, no, all except this one thing. Mary gets cancer and we go, well, this is a sad thing. Amen. It's sad that she got it. But the Bible says all things work together for good. And we go, maybe her loved ones will get saved when they see the faith she has as she's crossing over the other side. They walk in and see Mary sitting there as she's dying, and they're walking in crying, and she says, don't cry for me. I'm going to the other side. Let's sing a song. That's what's supposed to happen. But instead what's happened is there's new things now that we can't say all things work together for good. No, not this one thing. This person got that, and they died. They were 87, and it's terrible. I bet that 87-year-old saved saint thinks we're a bunch of fools. Yeah. Dude, 87 years old. After 87 years, listen, I'm 57 in a few months. I've been ready to go with the Lord for a long, long time, and I'm not lying. A long, long time. Long before I lost my wife and all the rest of that stuff, yeah. I was ready to go be with the Lord. I was ready to go be with the Lord as soon as I got saved. How real it was for me. I didn't care about getting married. I didn't care about having children. I didn't care about any of it. All I cared about was him. I got hooked. I got hooked. I couldn't let go of it. Well, I still can't. Watch this thing. And he said, and we'll end. Huh? And now you're going to see why. Because we've got some pres presumptuous folks here. Watch this. But they, and I got a whole message. You want round two? But they presumed to go up onto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord Moses departed not out of the camp. Now watch it. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in, in that hill. There's no mistakes. Right. You better go find out about those Amalekites and how they lived inside of caves underground. You might want to look up some of that stuff. You know what you'll find out? You'll find out there were bloodsuckers. You'll find out that they found ancient people that they believed were the Amalekites, and they actually had horns. And you know, you might think Dracula was a myth, but they didn't because they came across bloodlines that drank blood and actually did anyway. So, amen. Watch this. But they, and then it says in verse number uh, 45, the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites were dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto uh, Hormah. And I go on and on and on with what takes place here because they stop rebelling again in chapter 16, Korah rebels. All we get is rebellion and murmuring and complaining and complaining. I'll tell you what, I was brought up not to complain. We couldn't complain. I'm not lying to you. My grandmother was born in 1913. If you wanted to talk about heat, she could tell you about hot days. Cold? This is not. Walking well, to school? Hell, always. Right? You know, all that. Business. There was no getting around it. Never missed a day. Never sick. Third grade, I won an award for not missing a day of school. Never got sick. My grandmother had a way of helping you never get sick. She took Cairo syrup, she boiled it with, on with onions, and she put that on the stove. And we had the old gas stove. And she'd have that on there simmering nicely, right about the time people got coffee. And she'd say, not feeling well? And not a teaspoon, no. table spoon or two. Yep. And she'd go in there, not me. I'm fine and dandy. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It's, it's all real stuff. It and is. now I'm laughing about it, but it's but true. It sure and I looked is. into the Cairo yeah. syrup all of it. It's actually old, it's an old way. It's an old way of having medicine. Right. Yeah. Now listen, I, I, we're laughing, we're joking. The key thing here is when you pillow your head at night, make sure you're not been complaining all day right. about right. the lock and lock. Yeah. Right. We woke up this morning and the car didn't, the car didn't start. You know, 
car just starts all the time. Everything's fine right. in the car, right? She's going to pick up Mikey. We want to get him to church first time in the yeah. year, right? So all these things are happening, right? So you could either get complaining and murmuring, God made a mistake. You know, maybe God wanted you to pull up in mom's beat up car instead of the Cadillac to the shelter. I don't know. Maybe as a young woman walking out and seeing a beautiful girl get out of the car to get her son and she comes out of a shelter, maybe it would have made her not feel too good about herself. Right. I don't know. But I know all things work together for good. Amen. Yeah. Huh? Amen. So that's how that plays with no complaining. We'll complain enough tomorrow as we're trying to put the new one in. <laughs> we'll complain for everybody. Amen? Yeah. You know, like but, I ain't getting discouraged because I had a full car and then it went to not. Right. But I didn't complain because right. I was happy yeah. I was able to. Amen. And there's the key to take and continue on. It was a blessing to see Destiny, Destiny's friend come. He's the first visitor. We've only been here two Sundays, and by the and to have a visitor come in and to have somebody, you know, come in. It, it look at we were a year up there at that other place. Yeah. You want to talk about? I mean, you probably don't know it, but that was a lot. That was a lot on the young pastor having to deal with that, all that transpires. So what, what, how do you continue on? You don't complain. You don't murmur. And you don't begin to point and say, well, it must be that. It must be this. No, you know what it is? It's God. He's allowing this stuff to happen, and he's watching to see how we handle it. Will we handle it with the right spirit, or will we go through this again and again and again? Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we sure love you and thank you. Lord, I know that there's times where I begin to murmur and complain and question things. And I just want you to know, Lord, that I do believe everything in this book. And, Father, I believe every promise in here. And, Lord, I don't judge those men. But I do, Lord, want you to know that in my heart I never want to waver on my belief in every promise in this book that was sent out to whether it's the Jew or the Gentile, Lord. I believe, dear Lord, that you put it in here and that it will come to pass. We love you. We praise you. We pray for this week. We ask, Lord, that you bring people our way that we'll be able to be a a minister to. And that, Lord, I heard the ladies talking about people that they witness to all the time. Help them, God, to understand that sometimes it's just being themselves and being a friend and having those kind words that will make the difference, dear Lord. We love you. We praise you, and we thank you for all things. We do think a little Maddie tonight, and we pray for oh, her. God. Our heart is broken, you. God. She's been taken away from us, and we ask you to put a hedge around her, Lord, and we pray that you would just keep that little gal safe and bring her back to yes, us. God. We thank you for her mom, Destiny. We pray you touch her. Keep her close, Lord, now. We love you and thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.